Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. I want to interrupt your, uh, your salad eating just to say a few words to introduce tonight's events. Um, uh, uh, explain the dinner uh, and the purpose of the dinner and introduce our speaker. I'm going to introduce our speaker actually after dinner, but I want to say a few words before dinner about the Doolittle dinner and what it commemorates um, uh, to get you all motivated and oriented. Um, this dinner is um, organized in the honor of a great airman uh, and MIT alum. Yay! General James Doolittle. Uh, and this dinner was started by Harvey Sapolsky, I, I believe. Am I not incorrect? <laughs> Harvey, our former director of the Security Studies at MIT, initiated the dinner some years ago um, in honor of Doolittle because he's particularly appropriate to honor for, for, for many reasons. Um, and uh, I'll say, let me just say a few words about him and why we honor him. Uh, he's the only American uh, to receive both the Medal of Honor and the Medal of Freedom, which are the highest uh, military and highest civilian honors in the United States. Uh, and he's most famous for leading the Doolittle Raid on Japan, which happened uh, uh, 68 years ago in two days, I believe. It was uh, the 18th of April, uh, 1942. Um, when he and other volunteers launched uh, 16 B-25 bombers off the U.S. S Hornet uh, on a raid on Japan to attack Japan. And uh, this was quite a feat because neither the planes nor the Hornet were designed for this mission. Um, and um, uh, it was a very dangerous thing to do. And uh, three of the airmen were killed and others were captured by the Japanese. I believe several of them were murdered. Um, uh, but the raid was a big success because it shook the Japanese and made them change their war plans in ways that were advantageous for the U.S. He received the Medal of Honor for leading the raid. Um, and uh, he then later in the war um, uh, went to Europe and was uh, in North Africa um, uh, where he uh, commanded American bombing of uh, Germany in 19 from 1942 on July 42. He took charge of the 8th Air Force, um, and in February 43, uh, he assumed command of the Anglo-American, both British and American Air Forces in North Africa, um, and uh, um, continued with that until the summer of 1945, when he began preparing to move the 8th Air Force to Japan, um, and later continued on in serving in the Air Force, doing work to do with the development of ballistic missiles. Um, he retired in 1959 from the Air Force. Um, so he had a very long Air Force career and contributed a great deal uh, to the development of, um, of air power after the Second World War. And the most important thing is, not only did he uh, come from MIT, uh, where, by the way, he got a PhD. So those of you who don't yet have PhDs, get, get a PhD. You can, use it. you can be like, he's a good example in that regard, too. He finished his degree. Uh, Harvey, by the way, is the guy who coined the term gradual student. Uh, that's cruel, Harvey. You shouldn't, shouldn't be accurate, right, gradual student. I'm trying to inspire them. Uh, he also went to, United, yeah, to UC Berkeley for undergrad when he was in college. So Barry Posen went to Berkeley and I went to Berkeley. So, oh, yeah, David Weinberg went to Berkeley. So there's all kinds of reasons why we're going to honor uh, James Doolittle. So have your dinners, and when we're done with the main course, um, I think we'll ask uh, Professor Overy to, to speak. We'll be a little rude to him and ask him to talk through the, through the dessert, or at least the first half of dessert, second half of dessert. So enjoy your meal. I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Richard Overy, uh, professor of history at the University of Exeter. Uh, he's the author of more than 20 books on World War II air power and the European dictatorships, including um, an early book that many of us read when it came out, The Air War, 1939 to 45, which is the most comprehensive magisterial study of the use of air power in World War II. Um, the Battle of Britain, a more recent book on the Battle of Britain, um, uh, a book that some of you have read, a terrific book, outstanding book, uh, Why the Allies Won, which is a sort of an evaluative survey of the key decisions in the Second World War that, that led to its outcome. Um, Garing the Iron Man, uh, The Dictators. Uh, you also wrote a book on the origins of World War II. I can't remember the title, but 
The Road to War, which is a terrific sort of history of the lead up to war. Um, and he's the winner of the Wolfson Prize for History in 2005, um, a fellow of the British Academy and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. And he's going to give us a talk tonight on new perspectives on bombing in World War II. Very good. Well, thank you very much for those uh, kind words of introduction, and thank you very much indeed for uh, inviting me here to um, give this talk tonight, which I'm very proud to be able to do. Um, thanks to the uh, volcanic cloud now covering the United Kingdom, I may well be here for some time, in fact. <laughs> I may get to know you all much better. Um, it's interesting you mentioned the air war, because the air war was a book I wrote 30 years ago, actually. It's hard to believe. Um, and what I'm going to talk about now, perhaps, su suggests that uh, the history of air power has moved on a lot, actually, in the course of that 30 years. And many of the things I'm going to talk about this evening are things that were not really considered 30 years ago, and I certainly didn't consider them in my, in my book. Um, now, it seems to be very appropriate that, that I'm talking about bombing and giving the do little lecture and I don't know whether speakers you've had over the last few years have had that kind of connection but I'm actually talking tonight about something which do little himself actually did of course as uh, commander of the 8th Air Force in 1944 and 1945. Um, you gave us a short biography of do but I just wanted to add um, a couple of things of course that it's important to remember that Doolittle's uh, contribution to aviation in the 1920s, 1930s was pioneering instrument flying. Um, and it's quite interesting that when he was commander of the 8th Air Force in 1944 and 45, one of the things that, that he insisted that the Air Force did was to learn better blind flying. And it did a great deal of blind flying uh, over cloud and industrial haze in Germany uh, in the last months of the war. The second thing that also struck me going through Doolittle's uh, biography, of course, is that when he undertook this extraordinary raid on Tokyo, uh, it was first of all the first combat mission he'd actually flown on, and secondly that he was 45 years old when he did it. And when you get as old as I am, I'm always quite pleased to find people doing things at ages they shouldn't be doing them. Right? Um, Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about Doolittle, because much of what I'm going to talk about today uh, does relate directly, of course, to what Doolittle himself did uh, during the 1940s. New perspectives. So I want to start by talking about some old perspectives. What is it we think we know about the bombing offensives in the Second World War? Well, we can start off, of course, with what we might call the Air Force view. Um, which is still perhaps a dominant view, and it's um, to be found in a huge crop of recent histories about the 8th Air Force, about Bomber Command, about the bombing offensive, which is that bombing was a very important element in the Second World War, in both the German and the Japanese theatres. But it was very important, perhaps a decisive factor in both those um, theatres in bringing about defeat. It's a view which also emphasizes the extent to which um, the numerous casualties of war, which I'll come on to in a moment, were in some sense the victims of strategies which were predicated on destroying or degrading, as we now call it, the economic and military capability of the enemy states. And that that remained the key element in air strategy during the course of the war. Now against that, there are two other approaches, uh, both of which have their champions, recent champions. Um, the first is the argument that of course it wasn't in fact very important strategically. That goes way back to John Kenneth Galbraith in 1945 serving on the United States Strategic Bombing Survey uh, and his uh, subsequent uh, argument that bombing in fact achieved remarkably little it hardly inhibited the German economy at all, which expanded threefold its weapons output between 1941 and 1944. But it was, uh, Galbraith concluded, a waste of resources. 
that the resources the British and Americans spent on it could well have been spent on something more strategically or militarily useful. And a whole lot of people since Galbraith have argued very much that kind of case. When you look at what bombing claimed it was doing and then look at what actually happened on the ground, quite clearly it was a waste of resources that both of the major allied powers in the West could have spent those resources doing something rather different. The second critical approach to uh, bombing, which has perhaps attracted much more attention in recent years than uh, anything else, of course, is the uh, moral consequences of bombing. Um, now, Anthony Grayling, the book on bombing of German cities, the German journalist Jörg Friedrich, with a book called The Fire, which some of you may have read or know about, have both argued that essentially bombing was a war crime um, and that the uh, moral consequences of finding two liberal democracies engaged in um, a sustained campaign, which they regard as criminal, um, is a blight on the uh, achievements of the Allies in defeating the Axis states in 1945. That's an argument that you hear again and again now, of course, and indeed the moral debate about the nature of bombing is perhaps one of the most uh, important and certainly one of the most vexed areas of this whole argument. And I'm not going to make a moral argument tonight, but I'm aware of it. It's an issue that people uh, are, are very interested in. And if anybody wants to talk about it in the discussion afterwards or to ask me questions about it, I'm quite happy to field those. But it, as a historian, I don't see it as my job in the sense to pass judgment on what happened in the Second World War, but it is very important to make sure that we know what happened in the Second World War. Uh, and that we know it fully uh, and can draw conclusions from that. So that's the conventional story. Either it was great, the strategy worked, or the strategy didn't work, and not only did it not work, but it was immoral. Now what I want to talk about now are a whole lot of spins, in a sense, on some of those arguments. But much of these arguments, all well, three of them in fact, rest on a whole series of myths and misperceptions, I think, about the exercise of bombing in the Second World War, and it's some of those I'm going to be talking about this evening. But the other thing I want to talk about first is to start off with some figures. I want to talk about the figures, um, the numbers killed by bombing in the Second World War. In Germany, 490,000. In Japan, well, estimates vary. 280,000 is perhaps a reasonable estimate. In France, 65,000. In the United Kingdom, 64,000. In Italy, estimates between 60 and 70,000. Estimates in the Soviet Union suggest that something like 500,000 Soviet citizens were killed by the German bombing of, Germ of Soviet cities during the Barbarossa campaign. Now, if you add all those together, you have 959,000 deaths excluding the Soviet Union. And the Soviet figure is clearly not a very reliable one. If you add in the Soviet Union, we're talking about 1.4 million. In almost all the figures that we have, and we don't have complete figures, about those who are seriously injured or wounded by bombing, it's roughly the same number uh, as uh, the number of people killed. So we might suggest that during the course of the Second World War, something like 2.8 to 3 million people either died or were seriously injured as a result of the bombing campaign. I put those figures out only because we never really do put them together. Actually, when you put them together, it's an extraordinary number of people who are killed from the air, predominantly civilians. Uh, not exclusively, I mean, clearly there are policemen, firemen, soldiers and so on who are killed by bombing as well, but predominantly civilians, overwhelmingly because the cities were now, um, of course, short of men who have all been conscripted, um, a much higher proportion of women and children who were killed as a result of the bombing, but 2.8 to 3 million people perhaps who are the physical victims of bombing. Now, the important thing, I think, is that about uh, so many of the accounts of the bombing campaign don't really talk about what it's like to be in societies which experience that level of physical loss. You could put side by side with it, of course, the loss of housing, 
there's a structure that more than 50% of the urban area of Germany's major cities, just think of 50% of the urban area of Germany's major cities, but in Japan, in uh, Italy too, widespread destruction of the urban environment. But there is actually very little written on that experience. What is it that happens to society as a subject to that level of destruction, particularly as in the Second World War, this is the first time really for a long time that civilians have been in the front line. One might well argue in the Napoleonic Wars, of course, that there are a great many civilian deaths, one reason or another, as war crosses and recrosses uh, European territories. The first time, the first time for a long time that you've had anything like that level of civilian loss. Um, and it is going to um, force us to ask quite a lot of questions about the social and psychological and cultural reactions that these societies have, <coughs> excuse me, these societies have to the experience of bombing. I think the reason historians are spending so much time looking at this now, um, and everywhere, in Japan, Italy, France, Germany, Britain, uh, this is a subject that historians have begun to work on only in the last five or six years. There's a whole cluster of historians now who are working precisely on these kind of questions. I think it's clearly related, I think, to the um, experience of the um, bombing in the Kosovo crisis or the two um, Iraq wars or the bombing in Afghanistan. But it's actually forced people to focus a lot more on what it is that happens to the societies that are bombed particularly as what happens to those societies is also very important to the people who have recently been doing the bombing. But before we get on to that question, I mean, what do historians now look at when they talk about bombed societies? I want to come back to some of those myths and misperceptions that I talked about at the beginning, about the bombers themselves about the kind of questions we've not been asking, about things that we need to be uh, more honest or about or aware of. The first thing is this question of how important was bombing? Well, I mean, if you've read How the, Why the Allies Won, you'll know, of course, that I've argued in the past that bombing was indeed an important element in explaining uh, German and Japanese defeat. When I say how important, I think what struck me very much when recently I was going through the papers of the Casablanca conference in January 1943 between Churchill and Roosevelt and their staffs, which they discussed the strategic development of the war, what they were going to do for what turned out to be the last uh, two years and a bit of the conflict. And I was looking at these papers because I wanted to look at the discussion about the combined bombing offensive, which was launched from the Casablanca conference, um, eventually as Operation Point Blank. And I looked and I looked and I looked, and I couldn't find it anywhere. In fact, it was hardly ever mentioned in the course of the conference. Look at the memoranda, look at the minutes of discussions, particularly at the highest level. Bombing is not mentioned at all. Lots of politics, a lot about the Mediterranean, a lot about the expected invasion of Northern Europe. But in fact, bombing is mentioned only once or twice. And indeed, we know, of course, that the history of the Castlebank Conference, Arnold um, and um, other American air commanders had great difficulty getting access to Roosevelt and Churchill, trying to argue their case that the, they could actually carry on the business of strategic bombing. Um, and Roosevelt and Churchill approved it, not, I think, with any great enthusiasm at Casablanca, but because when Arnold asked them, they couldn't think of a reason not to say, yes, uh, you can continue to do it. And that, I think, for me, puts bombing into a, a certain perspective. Um, what was important to Casablanca, remained important in combined chiefs of staff discussions afterwards, was tactical air power which expanded for the Western powers enormously in 1943 and 44 and became extremely effective, of course, in the course of 1944, and which a lot of historians of the air war have always overlooked or ignored on the assumption that bombing must be the thing um, that we're looking at. Another example I found, actually, of how uh, uh, bombing needs to be, in a sense, relativized was the Quebec Conference, the other high-level high conference in 1943, between Roosevelt and Churchill and the uh, military staffs, where the British Chief of Staff, Chief of Air Staff, Charles Portal, uh, 
uh, desperately wrote to Harris saying, what figures have you got? How many houses have we destroyed? How many workers have we killed? Please, give me the figures so I can take them to Roosevelt and Churchill and tell them that bombing is something which is worth doing. Harris obligingly told them, uh, told Portal exactly how many houses they destroyed. And Portal went to uh, Churchill and Roosevelt and said, you've got to carry on sporting bombing. You've got to carry on bombing because we've destroyed at least, destroyed either destroyed or badly damaged at least 2.4 million homes in Germany and we're carrying on doing this at an accelerated rate over the course of the next year. And once again, the thoughts that had circulated at Quebec that perhaps air power might be used for something else, uh, uh, some other tactical purpose, uh, um, evaporated away uh, and bombing was given the continued go-ahead. But I say it only because I think it helps us put bombing into some kind of perspective. The people who write about the bombing offensive think it's very important, and the people who were engaged in it thought it was very important, uh, Air Marshal Harris particularly. Um, but it's important, I think, to see that this is only one part of what the West thought it was doing in 1943 and 1944. And I think seeing it that way might also allow us to emphasize much more how important tactical air power was, as it's been ever since. 1945. The second thing that never gets talked about is the bombing of Europe rather than simply the bombing of Germany. And it's quite significant, I think, that the official history that was produced in 1961 of uh, Bomber Command's offensive was called the Strategic Air Offensive Against Germany. And indeed, the focus of almost all the books that have been written about the bomber offensive since have been about the bombing of Germany. Partly, I think, because Germany was clearly the enemy, uh, and nobody was going to make much capital out of saying that we also bombed Italy, France, the Netherlands, Belgium heavily, um, and indeed that we killed more Italians and more Frenchmen than were killed in the German Blitz on Britain. A fact, I think, that I mean, to most British people is completely unknown. But the bombing of Europe was a very important part. It wasn't just the bombing of Germany, I mean, a few other little bits and pieces, but it was a seamless thing that when bombing commanders were planning what they were doing, they were thinking, what's our target today? Are we going to go to Munich? Are we going to go to Essen? Are we going to go to Paris? Are we going to go to um, uh, Genoa? In other words, that, that bombing was something which was thought of much more as a European phenomenon than we tend to think about it now. Only 50% of the bombs that were dropped by the American and British Air Forces on Europe were dropped on Germany. The other 50% were dropped on uh, all these other countries, including the rather strange decision to launch uh, an attack on the Bulgarian capital, Sofia, um, on the belief that if you bombed the Bulgarian capital, it would stop the Bulgarians from helping the Germans. It made the Bulgarians, it turned out, extremely angry. <laughs> Now again, looking at the archive, one of the strange things I found was I went to look at the archive on the bombing of Rotterdam, held at the Am Amsterdam uh, Institute of War History. And um, I expected to see it full of all the terrible things the Germans had done to Rotterdam in 1940, the famous bombing of Rotterdam uh, on May the 14th, 1940. But in fact, it was full of all the bombing of Rotterdam carried out by the 8th Air Force and Bomber Command. And in fact, when I went through the material there and added up the figures, of course you found that more people had been killed in Rotterdam by Allied bombing than had been killed by the Germans in the notorious attack in 1940. There's been some recent work by Belgian historians too on the bombing of Belgium, which again is not I mean, a completely unknown story. Um, now, of course, the Allies were not bombing these countries uh, just because they liked the idea of bombing them. They were bombing them because they were occupied by the Germans, and a great deal of their industry was working, of course, to German orders. Uh, that's why they were bombing uh, France, the Netherlands, um, and Belgium. It was a function, in other words, of economic warfare, and that's how it was presented. The bombing of Italy, of course, is slightly different because Italy was an ally of Germany. Uh, until September 1943, and the idea in Italy was that it, Italy, Italy's capacity to make war would be degrade, degraded in the same way that the German capacity to make war uh, would be degraded. But in the case of Italy, there was one difference, uh, both on the American and on the British side, 
The assumption was the Italian population lacked the discipline and spirit of the German population, and if it was bombed, it was much more likely to give up much faster. Um, as it turned out, it's perhaps one of the few predictions about the effects of bombing which turned out to be correct. Um, the bombing created mass panic in the cities of northern Italy. Um, it alienated the Italian population from the regime very rapidly. Uh, and in uh, July 1943, it's certainly no coincidence that Mussolini was overthrown five days after the first Allied bombing of Rome. It's also important, of course, to stress one big difference, that the bombing of France and Italy uh, was also the bombing uh, of a site of battle. But from June 1944 onwards, um, and from uh, September of um, 1943, um, France and Italy were fought over by Allied armies. And much of the bombing was, in fact, tactical rather than strategic. Uh, though the tactical bombing was often so long distance that the populations had experienced, I think, would have been hard pressed to recognize the difference between the two. The bombing of Europe then is not the same as the bombing of Germany, but since it consumed uh, around about half the bomb tonnage which was dropped on Europe during the Second World War, uh, it's part of a story which needs to be told. And I'm glad to say I think the French and Italian historians in particular, and also several of my colleagues who are working on a big research project at the University of Exeter on bombing, are working on precisely this. In other words, filling in a very important part of a narrative that I think has been largely neglected in the existing literature. The third thing I want to talk about is, I think, a more controversial area. And it's an area that much of the existing literature has obscured or ignored entirely over the years. That's about British bombing policy, uh, particularly bombing policy directed against the Germans. Now, everybody knows, of course, that Britain engaged in area bombing at night and the US Air Force engaged in precision bombing by day. And indeed, there are many historians now who've argued that, that what the US Air Force did was on the whole precision area bombing because precision was quite difficult under the circumstances of combat over Germany. Uh, and American bombs were spread quite widely. But the object of American attacks was always a specified range of military economic objectives. The British defence has always been, of course, and Harris's defence is that, that what they chose was a list of 100 industrial cities in Germany. If you, break, if you destroy an industrial city, you are reducing Germany's capacity to be able to make war effectively. But in fact, the material which I've been looking at this year for the book that I'm writing on the bombing war on the British side has shown a, a, a much bleaker picture. From 1941, the summer of 1941 onwards, the British Air Ministry and British Air Commanders made the decision that the only way they were going to be able to get any efficiency in it comes out of their bombing campaign was to abandon any thought of hitting marshalling yards or factories. The only way they were going to do it was to burn cities down. To burn cities down, to destroy residential housing, to kill workers. This was a deliberate decision. You can trace it through the archive um, of a, a rather menacing committee called the Incendiary Panel, which met from 1941, twice a month roughly, until 1944, and it was felt it was no longer necessary. And the Incendiary Panel, which was chaired by the Deputy Director of uh, Bomber Operations in the Air Ministry, had a single job, and its single job was to work out and to recommend the best way to burn the city down. Um, and you, we know, of course, that those deliberations worked effectively because Hamburg was burnt to the ground and 50,000 people um, killed in the course of a night. Now, throughout the war, when members of parliament, for example, raised questions saying that as far as they could see, the record suggested that the RAF was deliberately destroying cities, and housing, um, 
whoever was the current spokesman, the Air Minister or sometimes the Deputy Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, once or twice Churchill himself, would say, no, we are only hitting military targets. And that remained the argument all the way through to the end of the war, that we are only hitting military targets. Those military targets are in cities, of course, in many cases, so we don't have any choice but to hit the cities, and in the course of hitting them, we actually kill people. In fact, the planning was quite different from that. The incendiary panel drew up a memorandum, number of memoranda in 1942, which they had maps of every major German city. They divided the maps up to a series of zones. Zone 1 was the most densely populated residential area. Zone 2A was a slightly less resi uh, residential area, but less, less densely populated. Zone 4 was on the outside, that was the industrial zone. The recommendation was the industrial zone is hard to burn down. And even if you burnt it down, you don't destroy the machinery. The recommendation was that Bomber Command's operations from um, 1942 onwards should focus as far as possible on destroying Zones 1 and 2A. In other words, burning down the residential zones of Germany's industrial cities. And that's precisely what they did. The Ministry of Economic Warfare provided um, Harris with a list of 100 cities. Each city was given a point score uh, for its economic importance, and uh, Harris simply went through, and you can see the list, it's in his papers in the RAF Museum, and he put a, a line through and ticked off each city after he'd uh, destroyed it. And the measure for Bomber Command of its success uh, during, <coughs> excuse me, during 1943 and 1944, we had the measure of acreage destroyed, of workers' houses destroyed, and if possible, and by late 43 this became more possible with better intelligence, working out the number of people that you killed. Now I mention this only because I think it is very important for us to be clear that for all the attempts of historians to argue that you know this was collateral damage. Uh, all, for all the attempts at the time to put a gloss on it for the British public, that they were attacking cities which had industrial and military targets. In fact, British policy was predicated entirely on destroying residential houses and killing workers. Now, what about the effects on the societies of the bombed? Particularly, of course, the effects on Germany if that was in fact the strategy, to burn cities down. Now a great deal of work has been done by historians on this over the course of the last 10 years. And the first thing a, an historian would say, and I'm conscious that I'm saying this in a room full of political scientists, is that um, there is no single answer, that what we need to do is to stress the differences of course. These are not the same societies. France, Italy, Germany, Britain under the Blitz, they're all different societies and they react, of course, in ways, in some respects, which emphasize what we might regard as their key social or political characteristics. But there are some similarities which I think we can talk about first. I think the important thing is to answer the question, who was affected by bombing? Now, I've talked about the level of casualty uh, which was imposed in the Second World War, which is very high. But the important thing, I think, is to recognize that for societies, particularly Germany or Japan, subjected to sustained programs of strategic bombing, um, that bombing was a very important element of their social history in the Second World War. It didn't just affect the places that were attacked, of course. It affected the places where the planes flew over and flew back. The alarms went off all the time. Uh, indeed, the alarms went off so often that in the few case studies we've got, of German cities in 1944, uh, some workers found themselves spending five to six hundred hours in an air raid shelter during the course of um, a working year. And during 1944, any one day of the year, 25% of the native German workforce was not at work. Uh, that's an extraordinary level of absenteeism. Average absenteeism is something like five or six percent. 25% of German workers were not at work on any one day of the year in 1944. But it also affects the countryside, of course, because bombs drop randomly on villages, often, in fact, during the course of the campaign. 
Well, not only that, of course, that the countryside and smaller towns in all the areas that are bombed, sure Britain, sure Italy, France, and Germany too, and Japan, uh, rural areas and small town areas find a flood of refugees and evacuees coming out. And indeed, that produced all kinds of social difficulties and social tensions. And the numbers were enormous. In Germany and in Japan, by the end of the war, somewhere between 8 and 9 million people were evacuated from the major cities. They had to go to find somewhere to live. They had to be fed. The welfare system had to work. It didn't work very well in Japan. Uh, it worked reasonably well in Germany, but not all that well. Um, all of these things represented, in other words, a burden on society as a whole, not, of course, just a burden on the city that was going to be bombed that night. Uh, the city that's going to be bombed that night. In fact, the ripples out from that attack um, are very substantial. The more, of course, a country is subjected to attack, as Germany was, of course, the more regular and persistent those impacts become. But there were wide differences, of course. The German population is perhaps the most remarkable story, and uh, it's difficult putting it this way round. People never do. People always talk about, you know, when, when is Germany going to crack? When was Germany's morale going to you know, um, uh, uh, give way? But in fact, the extraordinary thing is that you could drop um, a million and a half tons of bombs on a sophisticated urban technical society and it continues to function continue to function right until the end of the war um, it was breaking down of course in the last stages of the war but actually the German capacity to organize its war effort to keep producing, to provide food to make sure the welfare was there to get the railways working again was a quite extraordinary achievement and it's a measure perhaps of uh, some of the peculiar characteristics of German society that it was able to do so and indeed without the bombing of course it's a reflection of just what Germany might have been capable of doing uh, with a bomb free economy but in Italy as I've already suggested of course the population panicked on the whole and once the bombing became heavy it was only a matter of time before Italy's war effort which was already uh, feeble by the standards of the other combatant powers uh, gave way uh, in France, um, civil defence against bombing was reasonably well organised, but in France, like in Italy, there was also widespread panic um, and um, a, a failure, in a sense, to cope with the uh, implications of the bombing once the bombing had started uh, in earnest, particularly in 1943 and 1944. Japan, too, once it was subjected to heavy bombing, and it was intense bombing, of course, of its urban areas, there again, the fabric of uh, local life and the fabric of uh, the state gave way very quickly. Um, we might well argue whether the atomic bomb was vital or not, and we can argue that I mean, in, in bringing about Japanese surrender. But in fact, even before the atomic bombs, um, LeMay's campaign against Japanese cities produced conditions which were insupportable, I think, in the short term. Now, what determined the different responses the countries had to the impact of bombing? Well, there are a couple of things I think we could pick out which seem to me to be particularly important. One of the most important, it seems to me, is what we might call the militarization of civil society. Well, that was something which was going on in Germany in the 1930s, and it was going on on a very large scale. By 1939, when war broke out, the German Air Defence Association, the Reichsluftschutzbund, had 13 million members. Uh, they went to training courses, they all did first aid, um, a huge number of volunteers uh, organised Germany's civil defence right down to the level of every flat, every factory, every um, street. It, it was an extraordinarily regimented and effectively regimented system of passive defences. The same is true of Britain, too. Once Britain had realized the nature of the threat, late 1930s, a huge army of people are recruited uh, to organize the civil defenses, to run the auxiliary fire service, to act as air raid precaution wardens and so on. And they're quite heavily militarized. They're all given uniforms, they're all given training sessions and so on. They have quite close links with uh, army units um, in their area. 
I found letters uh, in local archives in Britain of people who'd not yet got a uniform writing indignant letters to the local authorities saying, you know, that we haven't got a uniform yet, you know, we're not going to do this, let me get a uniform and a helmet. Um, now that's an unusual thing in a sense, it's not what one quite expects perhaps from British society. But it very struck within the last year of peace before the outbreak of war in September 39, and then in the phony war up until, uh, well really in Britain really, uh, up until the onset of the Blitz, uh, there was a concerted drive to produce a very large volunteer home army, if you like, to undertake uh, the task of civil defence and indeed much else as well. And this was not the case in Italy or in France, um, and not the case in Japan. Uh, and it says something, I think, about the nature of the state system, both in Germany and in Britain, a comparison I think we can make about a rather cent a very centralised an effective state structure which was able to mobilize a high level of voluntarism and to integrate and utilize that uh, effectively. Another factor of course depends on levels of intensity and length of attack. The difficulty of course comparing anything in Afghanistan or Iraq to the Second World War, of course, is that we're talking about campaigns that are very short, short and sharp. Um, in the Second World War, we're talking about campaigning in Germany, which begins with the first attack on a German city. Well, the first attack is on the second day of the war, um, but the, it begins really in May 1940 and carries on until uh, April 1945. In Italy, too, first day of the war, June 1940, RAF flies over the Alps, um, reading the um, uh, interviews with pilots who did this, they said it was incredibly difficult, freezing cold. The first trips, they took leaflets with them, they were so cold they couldn't be bothered to undo the pack, so they threw out the leaflets in huge chunks like this, which must have had something like the same effect as a bomb on the poor people underneath. Um, but right from the beginning of that war, um, right until uh, 1945, when German troops retreating through the Brenner Pass were subject to heavy bombing. Italy was also subject to uh, bombing. Uh, in France, um, the levels of intensity um, and duration were much less than was the case in Germany or in Italy. And in Britain too, bombing really starts in June 1940 and then peters out uh, in May 1941. There's a bit of intermittent bombing thereafter. But again, for the British, it's an experience of a year it's a very important year because it shapes much of Britain's view of itself during the war and indeed of, uh, you know, of Britain, uh, the, the willingness of the British population to continue uh, the struggle. But different levels of intensity and length of attack also clearly determine the capacity of a society to be able to endure it. Which is why, as I've said, the German case is so remarkable that they could in fact endure that and continue to function. Uh, not, of course, 100%, but effectively enough by 1944 to be producing <coughs> excuse me, three times as many weapons as they were producing in 1941. Now the big question of course that everybody wants to know the answer to is did bombing demoralize these populations? Well I talked about a number of responses and nobody would pretend of course that people like being bombed. Uh, people panicked. Um, narratives of fear are evident everywhere in all the uh, environments in which uh, bombing takes place. But it did not demoralize in the sense that bomber commanders hoped it would demoralize. In other words, produce a political dividend. That it would force the Germans to overthrow Hitler any more than you know, Hitler's expectation that bombing might force the British public to overthrow Churchill. Why not? Because obvious reasons, in fact, all the evidence from all the countries that we've been looking at demonstrate that for most people the experience of bombing is fearful and demoralizing. It produces a reaction of apathy um, after the experience. These populations are the least likely to be engaged in any kind of active political dissent or forms of popular protest which might have any effect at all. A few times it happens in Germany, for example, uh, of course, it's subject to um, ferocious um, state terror. Uh, 
But I think that's not really, terror's not really the point. The point is, in fact, the expectations that if you bomb people, the people who have been bombed will therefore become political revolutionaries was always a naive expectation and was not borne out anywhere in the course of the Second World War. Um, and indeed, um, it, it would be strange, I think, had that been the case. What about the long-term effects of bombing on these societies? Just a couple of things I want to say about that. The first is that the whole concept of, um, uh, of trauma, which we're now all familiar with, didn't exist, of course, in that sense, in the Second World War, certainly not in 1945. But it's evident that those populations that were subject to bombing, um, it did produce very high levels of psychological disorientation. That fear on that level over such a sustained period of time, of course, is bound to have its psychological cost. The extraordinary thing, I think, is the extent to which it was either disregarded, in other words, it was something that would have to be coped with in the private sphere, um, um, or people themselves, um, you know, this back to the blitz spirit, if you like, people themselves actually did find ways, in the sense of healing those problems, not completely, but enough to be able to survive and indeed to go on after the end of the war. The German uh, psychoanalyst who came to one of the workshops of um, our bombing project last year um, has set up a special program in Berlin, it's a very interesting program. Um, he was always puzzled by this question, why wasn't there more psychological reaction to bombing? And he set up a program of psychoanalysis for elderly Germans um, who only now, years later, they were children of course during the course of the bombing in the Second World War, are owning up to the extraordinary psychological effects that the experience of bombing had on them. And he found all kinds of things. He found adults in their 50s and 60s still bedwetting. Um, he found others who had been completely incapable of uh, having a physical relationship since the end of the Second World War. Now you might argue that psychoanalysts are always looking for this kind of thing. But actually his account was very interesting because there were a lot of people that he's interviewed um, and tried to help, including the children of people who had been bombed in the Second World War, and some of whom, um, uh, in the kind of, sort of Munchausen syndrome, had picked up the reaction of the mother, particularly, uh, who had been deeply affected by bombing, whose behavior had been affected by the bombing, and they themselves then replicated that behavior uh, and came to see this psychoanalyst in their 30s and 40s, with a range of problems they couldn't really explain until he asked them about their mother and their mother's experience and was able to show that, that what, they were trying, what they were doing was in some sense compensating for or imitating a psychological behavior of the parent. Now I think that's a subject that historians and psychologists will find very difficult to reconstruct and the people who experienced it are dying off or are dead. Um, but it's in a sense a hidden aspect of the bombing campaign which I think uh, we need to be more aware of. The last thing I want to say is what about the experience of bombing for the countries that experienced it worst, Japan and Germany? Huge numbers of dead, uh, the complete destruction of the urban infrastructure. Um, it's tempting, I think, to look at the aftermath of the Second World War and say that what's remarkable, of course, is that in Germany and Japan, both of them uh, countries with a strong military tradition. Um, it disappears in 1945 and it's never been revived since. The Germany and Japan by the 1950s and 1960s are completely different countries from the countries they were in the 1930s. The elites are different, they have different values, their expectations are different, their ambitions are different. And I suppose if, if we're to conclude anything from the impact of bombing, this is not I think a reason for recommending it at all, but I think it is difficult not to conclude that the physical, visible wreck that these two countries were at the end of the war did play a very important part in turning those populations away from the militarism and imperialism that had characterized their development for perhaps three quarters of a century, if not more, uh, and turn them to embrace uh, the values of the societies that had bombed them in the first place. Thank you very much. <laughs>
sure that none of the graduate students are, are called on. <laughs> <laughs> Owen Cote. Uh, Richard, could you uh, elaborate on that last point? No, I mean, clearly there are other factors. And I think probably one of the things uh, that, that um, much of the new research on bombing has tried to emphasise is the extent to which bombing, of course, is just one of the factors that many of these societies are having to, to face. And when we talk about demoralisation, um, it, 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 it's impossible to argue that, you know, that the reason Germans, if they feel demoralised in 1944, feel demoralised is just because of bombing. They're demoralised because you know, they're being pushed out of Russia. They're demoralised because the Allies are invading France. There are lots of other reasons why. And, um, I mean, what struck me, I think, um, but particularly in the German case, which I know better, is looking at a lot of the letters and diaries and so on that people are writing in the later stages of the war, um, where there are uh, perceptive Germans saying, you know, you know, look at the bomb, look what's happening. You know, this is a punishment for us. It's a punishment for the way we are. Or this is a punishment for what we've done to the Jews. And I think rather than seeing it in the way we might expect them to see it, you know, those awful Americans and British, you know, how dare they do this to our wonderful cities and so on, you know, we're going to hate them forever. They didn't see it, they internalized it much more, I think, and, and saw it much more as a consequence of something which they had done. Um, now, that's not, I mean, rock solid evidence, but it's an interesting perception, I think. And I think a number of educated Germans took that kind of view. I think the other thing is the the process of reconstruction itself, where the few case studies we've had, and there are some very good ones, new book by Neil Gregor on Nuremberg, an excellent book, a study of what Nuremberg does about the bombing, is that there was a self-conscious effort to distance the new states, the new, sorry, cities, from the uh, heavy historical legacy that they were trying to cope with. Um, and to see these cities as cities which would be built um, for a new age, um, they would be built, uh, they're built with wide avenues, they're built with new apartment blocks and so on, they're built, they're built for the 20th century. And I think that, that there is a great deal of self-conscious planning to distance Germany and German cities from what Hitler wanted to do with them, which is to put up lots of um, you know, wonderful statues and neoclassical buildings and huge military parade grounds and so on. Um, so it's not, I think, just, you know, just simply unreflective. I think it's a product of a society that is thinking very much about physical damage and what you're going to put in its place. Harvey Spolson, I have two questions. So one is, aren't you leaving out one population to consider? And that's uh, maybe two. The United States American population, who is doing the bombing, who is supporting the bombing, and part of the British who... You know, the United States didn't experience the bombing directly, the population, but they certainly must have supported it because the alternative, they, I think they understood from their World War I experience was lots of dead American or German, I mean British or whatever, soldiers in the trenches. And this was, so it was a terrible thing to do, but it had a, it had a good rationale or acceptable rationale in another population who did it, who supported it. There, I, I mean, I don't know if there was a lot, there was some moral, I'm sure some moral wavering on the part of the population here, but they didn't not support it. That, that's one question. The second one, haven't we changed tremendously? Right now, the, uh, the UN keeps statistics on the number of civilians killed in Afghanistan. I believe the number last year was somewhere around 2,000 civilians out of a population of 30 million. Only about three or 500 were killed by bombing, and yet the American command doesn't allow sort of random bombing or uh, bombing independent of soldiers engaged in uh, direct combat. So any bombing has become a huge political issue uh, for populations very far distant from the war. Uh, it, and, and they're supposedly the Afghan population, though I don't know why they would know much about what's going on in you know, three valleys over, but apparently they do. Um, but, it, you know, there's first the population back here, and second, the change in the world since the Second World War.
No, well, I mean, because they are related questions in a way. But, I mean, your first question, I mean, I didn't deal with that because it's, it's not a new question in the sense that you know, people, uh, you know, people have written uh, excellent books looking at British and American strategy, air strategy, and the reasons for it have argued this kind of case. Well, support. Um, but support is interesting because I, was, I had a section which I didn't have time, I realised, to, to talk about, which is, which is this other aspect of the history of the bombing campaign in which people who were hostile to it either within the other services or within the home population, have been almost entirely marginalised from the, 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 the narrative. And in the British case, it's much more pronounced than it is in the American case. It's curious, that's partly because the British were bombed, actually. There was a lot of feeling in Britain that this was an awful thing to experience. You didn't want to impose it then on the workers and women and children of another country. And it's very interesting, opinion polls that were taken on just that question in Britain um, you always had less than 50% of the population in bombed areas were in favour of bombing the Germans. If you went to, and, and there was one uh, opinion poll deliberately taken in the north of England, rural small town areas, which had seen no bombing at all, where you had uh, portions of 70 or 80% in favour of bombing the Germans, and that was quite a, quite a revealing statistic. But in Britain, there's a lively debate in 1940 and 41. Um, not just Vera Britain, which is what everybody's always heard about, but about a lot of debate with um, uh, leading figures in Parliament and so on, um, in the churches, in a wide variety of other uh, areas, um, who contested the claims of bomber command that it was only hitting military targets, uh, or deplored the switch to night bombing, which they said was bound to result in high civilian casualties. This debate goes on through 1941 40, peters out in 1942. Uh, partly because it's, you know, the critics have been so completely ineffective. But in the summer of 1941, a petition is got up, in fact, uh, against night bombing. Um, now, it only gets, in the end, 16,000 signatures, but mainly from the, the great and the good, not from um, the, the, the wider population. But I think even that's quite a significant figure in the middle of a war, in which you've just been bombed for um, nine months heavily by the Germans. You can get people who think this is not something that Britain, as a democratic state, the rural state, should be doing to, to somebody else. Um, in America, the, the debate is more muted, but it exists. But it was stifled quite early on, in fact, and quite a strong effort of newspapers and so on, syndicated newspapers, not carrying articles by uh, pacifists who were arguing against the bombing. Um, but quite a number of church groups um, that kept up contact with the uh, British anti-bombing groups and so on, had tried to get pamphlets issued or uh, material published. But actually, uh, it was easier to do it in Britain than it was in the United States, where there was a much um, firmer censorship of, of that kind of argument in 42 and, and 43. The British government thought about censoring it, closing down the pacifist newspapers, even putting some of the people in prison, but in the end decided that that would be counterproductive. That's uh, almost certainly the right decision, because in fact the pacifists didn't, in the end, make any difference to bombing strategy. But, uh, but it is an important part of the story. I think it's important to see these are not monolithic societies when it comes to thinking about the moral consequences of bombing. Richard, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, uh, to extend your remarks when you talked about the bombing of um, uh, not, you know, everybody but Germany. You talked about how lots of civilians were killed in France and the Netherlands, uh, formerly allied countries. I wonder if you could say more about how the uh, allied strategists thought about this. Um, killing large numbers of civilians in allied countries, something you don't do lightly. Uh, I remember during, you know, during the Cold War, the U.S. eventually swore off that view of using those of tactical nuclear weapons in Eastern Europe because the idea was you know, the civilians were, were trying to protect, not kill. And secondly, you said very interestingly that we now, it's fairly clear that uh, the British were uh, focusing on bombing districts 1 and 2A or whatever it was. The, um, uh, civilian housing, not the factories. How did that play out when they thought about bombing um, the uh, French and Belgian and, and Dutch areas? Uh, and isn't this kind of an interesting test of the degree in which they were trying to engage in terror bombing? Because the idea of terrorizing those workers didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Those weren't enemy civilians, quote unquote. So if you want to sort of measure the degree to which the bombing of civilians was done in order to terrorize civilians, maybe you want to compare the way the bombing was done of Germany versus France, and that's yeah. the difference. That might be a measure of, yeah. of that motive. So talk more yeah. about 
Well, no, I mean, it is exactly a measure indeed, because they worried about it a lot and they discussed it a lot. They discussed the British discussed it in the Foreign Office, the Armed Forces, and so on. Churchill. Then, when, when the United States came into the war, uh, there were lots of discussions between um, Americans and British about exactly that, uh, and they, they, of course, treated them differently. That attacks on the Netherlands or on Belgium or on France were supposed to be on targets of military or war economic significance, which could be easily identified. And if you couldn't see it properly, if it was cloudy or there was uh, smoke, you brought your bombs back. And many American airmen did bring their bombs back rather than drop them indiscriminately on, on French towns. Um, uh, and there was discussion about the use of incendiaries in attacks in France. Um, uh, again, there was a lobby saying that if we dropped incendiaries, we'd cause more damage and so on to workers' housing and so on and so on. But that was, again, you can't do that because the object is not to destroy the houses of French workers, uh, but it's, it's to destroy very particular factories which are working with the Germans. So much greater effort was made to bomb accurately and to avoid civilian casualties. Um, but that restriction was lifted really from late 43 onwards because of the tactical needs to destroy French communications, um, French marshalling yards, bridges and so on for the preparation of D-Day. And there, they knew perfectly well that even if you got endless leaflets, which they did, um, you know, French peasants are not going to, not even French peasants are going to pick one up and read it and even understand it. And they accepted that it was going to produce high level of casualties, you've done it, 20,000 plus. Uh, dead. And they discussed this with three French leaders, and the three French leaders said, well, well, famously, Jules says, you know, c'est la guerre, um, which uh, is a slightly cynical way of, of writing off 20,000 of your fellow countrymen. Um, but, um, but, but it's the same in Italy, too, that even when Italy was on the Allies' side after September 43, uh, the assumption was that you just you couldn't let up on the bombing of Italy, because you were not bombing the Italians, you were bombing the Germans, and German communications and Italian factories working for the Germans. So there again, the rules of engagement were relaxed as well, and huge numbers of civilians were killed as a result. But it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't the same as it, you know, they didn't want to do it, but they recognized that village of necessity impelled it, whereas in the German case, they deliberately planned to destroy cities in the way of those kind. So just, just to make it clear for me, after 43, the way the Allies were targeting France was just the same as Germany? Not just to say, no, no, because it never targeted whole cities in order to obliterate them. And the problem was with the, the French um, Atlantic ports, for example, Brest and Lorient and so on, which are completely obliterated, 80, 90 percent obliterated. Uh, it was not because they were trying to obliterate the city, but they were trying to hit the submarine pens with huge numbers of aircraft carrying very heavenly armaments. And they couldn't destroy the submarine pens. And while they were doing it, of course, they destroyed all the housing around. Uh, thank you for the great talk, Professor O'Brien. I'm afraid I have to uh, respond with a very general question since I, I can't get as specific as you can. But you mentioned in your in your lead up, you, you sort of had a throwaway line about how you know you don't see it as the historian's role to uh, make moral judgments about some of these things. But in fact, your entire presentation was suffused with a sort of uh, moral sensibility about it that drove the questions you asked and the types of things you talked about and the things that you found relevant or irrelevant. Um, and I guess I'd sort of like your opinion on, uh, you know, how it is that you go about doing your work with these moral questions in mind and, and how you think that historians ought to take these kinds of questions. You know, we political scientists are caught up in this presumption that we can say very general things about everything. Uh, you know, it sort of rules out a certain area of inquiry for us. Um, which I think is sometimes not very productive. And then I turn to historians who I presume are going to be the leading lights on these kinds of things, and they tell me, oh, no, no, I'm just an historian. I can't speak of these things. And I actually found your presentation very persuasive and very provocative and very you know, interesting on some of these moral questions. And I guess I'd just like to hear your point of view on how to address these kinds of issues. Well, I mean, it was a very remark, and I should elaborate it. Um, I mean, of course, as historians, we have moral sensibilities, and on the whole, I don't think it's a very good idea to drop huge quantities of bombs on women and children, or to burn cities down deliberately. Um, and it would be hard to find anybody who did think that, I think. Um, I think the, what the difference I'm trying to make is that much of the recent material that's been written on the bombing campaign is emotional stuff. 
uh, just basically says this was a war crime, you know, and you know, Churchill should have hanged and so on and so on, and um, and uh, you know, this is a moral outrage and so on and so on. Now historians might feel morally outraged, but our job is to construct the narrative, and in constructing the narrative, you can choose the way that you do it, and perhaps the way that I did it this evening too. Uh, it makes it clear that these are questions which, um, you know, once you, once you have the narrative there and the material there, um, you know, these, these will raise awkward questions. But I'm not going to be the one that says, you know, my starting point is that I think all bombings are moral and the British and American airmen were war criminals, uh, and here's my proof. I think that's really the difference, and I think that, you know, we work on the Holocaust all the time, I work on the Holocaust a lot, and, and again, you, what you don't do is you don't preface the Holocaust by saying, you know, I'm absolutely outraged by this, this is the you know, worst thing I've ever come across, you know, these people should have all hanged. You just simply, you know, you, you, write, you write what happened, and people um, will, will read what you've written, and they will draw their own conclusions. John Lindsay. Uh, thanks very much. Really interesting talk. We talk a lot about the effects of strategic bombing, and my question is about the, the causes, the origin of the doctrine. Um, the uh, director of our program, Barry Bozeman, is really associated with the idea that Air Force is really like strategic bombing because it gives them autonomy, it gives them resources, control, and whatnot. Um, but uh, if I'm remembering correctly from uh, some of your arguments in your books, um, you said that actually there was a lot of political efficacy and the political leaders themselves were, were pushing for strategic bombing and pushed this on organizations, uh, which is you know, a very different account from you know, what, what we normally think that like, hey, Air Force is like strategic bombing, but they only do attack air when one of the politicians intervene. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the civil military relations in coming up with ideas about bombing, why you're bombing whether it's the right thing for an Well, I mean, it's a very interesting question, and I mean, it's been quite a lot written on, on this, which is why I didn't talk about it much in my talk. Uh, but it is, of course, from the Air Force point of view, a happy coincidence that in Churchill and Roosevelt, you have two people both committed to air power, have a rather naive view of what air power is capable of doing, but are absolutely clear in their minds that it's, first of all, you know, what modern, heavily industrialized state should be doing because it's a cost-effective way of waging war and you don't um, suffer huge um, manpower losses. Um, and uh, you know, secondly, because um, this plays to British and American strengths. They don't have large continental armies with the experience of the Soviet or the German army. They've got to find some way of uh, defeating an enemy they regard as particularly malign, capable of anything. Um, and uh, again, this seems to be in some ways an, the appropriate weapon. Of course, I mean, Churchill says it's the only weapon they've got in 1940. It's not the only weapon. You could think of other ways in which you might use your war economy or your scientific and technical skills. Bombing is not the only thing the Americans or the British could do. Um, but it is something, I think, which, which political leadership as well as the, uh, the Air Force leadership together uh, agree that this, this is in some sense what modern states do, it's how you wage total war and, and that um, it, you know, it has a number of advantages. It means you're destroying the enemy's economy, uh, which might be a quick way to end the war. It, it isn't, of course, in the end. Um, and you are reducing the burden on your democratic populations as a result of that. But the doctrine from the, from the Air, Force, Air Force point of view, which has been explored very well, I think, in um, Tammy Biddle's book, Rhetoric and Reality. It goes back a long way to the end of the First World War, right, where, um, again, it's tied up, I think, with this concept of modernity, what's appropriate in modern states. Um, and, and they developed this, this theory, really, about the vulnerability of modern industrial urban societies and their populations to um, interruption by bombing. Um, and in, in the United States, at the Air Force Tactical School in the 1930s, um, as a series of, of, um, of teachers there who, who developed this idea of the social web, quite sophisticated ideas about the social web, but what it is that makes cities particularly vulnerable. And indeed, when, they, when they're thinking about this in the months just before the outbreak of war, the, the American war, um, they start looking at American cities to model what um, might happen if they were ever engaged in war and undertaking a strategic campaign themselves. What is it about New York that's vulnerable? You know, what are its nodal points? What would you need to destroy? 
And the British did very much the same thing. They spent a lot of time in 1941 and 1942 studying the effects of the German blitz on their own cities to draw conclusions about what it was about cities that worked and didn't work and therefore what it is you ought to be attacking when you're attacking. You know, in the end, it didn't bother, they just attacked whole cities. But, but they spent some time thinking about that. So uh, uh, there's, a, I think, I mean, a curious, let's say, curious marriage, really, I think, between whether politicians view what, you know, what's appropriate in waging total war, but also the way in which in Britain and America, this conception of modern war with a capital M is what drives them on to the idea that, in fact, bombing is, you know, is, is, is the weapon of a modern state. I've got to have a good one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Overy. I'm afraid I have to teach on ethics, so I'm going to ask you a little bit more about it. Um, particularly because the dictators made a very sort of powerful case that intrinsic to the nature of the Soviet and the German war efforts was the nature of the leaders of the state. So let me ask you sort of two questions leading off of that. One is that are there conceivable British and American sort of right, presidents, prime ministers, or senior officers in the military? Who would have made a different set of choices? Right? Can you imagine where there are people you can identify who would have said no? Because it seems to me that it was totally unanimity on this case, and the moral question becomes, you know, not clear, at least a little bit different. And then the second, the second sort of ask is, given what we know about the efficacy of this of the bombing campaign and the cost it imposed, I sort of, if I, if I could put you on the spot a little bit, is is there a conceivable efficacy of the bombing that would justify what happened? Right? Is it at the end of the day, we sort of know what we did and how, how bad it was. Is there any level of efficiency that would be worth this level, this devotion of resources to a cause that at least is debatable? Well, well, of course, there were plenty of people who thought that the resources could be used differently. Um, in, um, in, in, in Britain in 1941 and 42, the army leadership, particularly um, uh, Allenbrook, uh, the chief, uh, chief of the general staff, uh, but also the Navy leadership too, they certainly thought that the, the resources devoted to bombing were not worthwhile, Brooks certainly didn't think they were, and that they could in fact use those resources um, to strengthen the Navy's position, uh, to make invasion possible. Um, and um, in Brooks' case, but also in the case of a number of, of uh, Air Force officers too, who were not so convinced of, of Harris's argument, that you concentrated much more on producing uh, large, high-quality tactical air forces. And the tactical air forces would, in the end, do the Clausewitzian thing. It would defeat the German air force, defeat German uh, forces in the field, and you know that would be the, the, the end of the war. So there are plenty of people around who, you know, who, who um, had a, you know a different scenario. Um, could it have been done differently? I mean, I think it could have been done differently. I think you can think of uh, well. I think in 1940-41 and early 42, when the British bombing effort was doing nothing in fact, and, and, and eating up resources, yes, there was a point at which you might well have said, well, let's stop doing that because it doesn't work. Well, if it does work, it'll take years, and uh, who, knows, who knows what's going to happen. Let's put all our resources into producing high-quality, fast fighter bombers. Um, let's produce thousands of mosquitoes, which were much more effective, of course, um, um, you know, delivery system, um, or let's think differently about the way we organise our armed forces and what our expectations are. Um, but um, I mean, the reason that doesn't happen, and there are several points at which it almost happens in the spring of '42, before Harris is appointed, at the end of '42, beginning of '43, before point blank, um, there are strong voices saying that this is really not going to work. We've got to, you know, Bomberman's got to accept it, and we've got to try and think about something something else. And Harris comes in at just that point and says, no, 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 you know, me, the Ministry of Economic Warfare and you know, other people, we've all worked it out, it will work, you know, just give us the time and the resources and we'll demonstrate that it will work. And Harris single-mindedly um, sticks to that. The same with Arnold too, because Arnold is, is under a lot of pressure to show that the Army Air Forces can do something that Air Forces can do rather than just simply supporting what the, the, the army is doing. Um, and you know, the, that commitment, which is reinforced again and again by Roosevelt, of course allows the army air forces to build up this huge strategic bombing capability. Um, uh, and that's, I mean, in a sense, it's, a, it's, it's, in a, it, it's an accident of, of the capacity of Harris and Arnold, if you like, to argue their case. but. I think it is perfectly possible for us to see that, that both uh, in the United States and in Britain, um, 
those resources might have been distributed rather differently and you know, strategy might have been thought out differently. You look at the battle to create effective tactical forces in 1943, 44 in North Africa and then transfer that experience to, to, to France. Um, you, know, you get some, some glimpse of what certainly the RAF might have been capable of being able to do for a much earlier stage. Uh -huh. Joseph um, I was interested to hear what you had to say about the results in uh, Germany after the war and the uh, societal effects that occurred because of the strategic bombing. And I know that um, in the United States there was at least a little bit of self-reflection about what the strategic bombing meant and what was like Slaughterhouse Five. Gravity's Rainbow also talks a little bit about the senselessness of the war. And I'm curious, um, you talked a little bit about the opposition of strategic bombing. Um, at a societal level in Great Britain during the war, and I'm, I'm curious, have there been any interesting cultural manifestations in terms of how British society came to terms with what they did? I mean, certainly from a strategic standpoint, you can evaluate what it meant to the war, but of course, you know, hundreds of thousands of civilians were killed by British planes, and I, I'm, I'm curious how exactly you know, British society came to terms with that. I, I know there was some discussion between, I think, Dover it was, and in Hamburg, the two cathedrals that were destroyed, um, there was some discussion on that level. But I'm, I'm curious, what is what is the societal effect on a society that you know commits the strategic bombing as opposed to the society that actually was the product of the bombing? Well, of course, the thing about Britain was that it was also a strategic bombing, so and that's remained at the center of Britain's self-image of the war right the rest of the present day. That you know, the blitz meant that somehow you didn't have to think hard about what it was that you were doing to the Germans. Um, and I, mean, I think for, for many, most British people, right down to the present day, that's always remained the, the simple way of, of, uh, of explaining it. Nonetheless, in 1945 and thereafter, there developed quite a strong lobby um, in Britain, which, which did feel guilty about the bombing, did think that you know, Dresden, Hamburg and so on was a step too far. Um, and that debate has never really gone away. I mean, Anthony Grading's book, among the dead cities that I talked about at the beginning is just the, the last of a whole series of books which have, which have questioned, starting with David Irving in Dresden in the 1960s, which have, which have questioned whether this is something that, that, that the British ought to have done. Um, uh, so the Blitz has always given high, high profile. I think perhaps the British don't reflect very much on really what, what the bombing of Germany amounted to, but don't feel, uh, you know, except for those, those people who you know, who, who, who lobby like Grayling or Irving said this was uh, a, a war crime. Don't I think, think very much about it. In fact, most British people have no idea, for example, that half a million people were killed in Germany by, by the bombing. They had no idea how many people were killed in the Blitz, of course, it doesn't matter to them because the Blitz has just become part of that, you know, the, the mythic way of looking at the, the, at, um, at, uh, at the British experience. Um, what you do find this still consistently uh, strong opposition to anybody who um, tries to argue the case um, that bombing was the equivalent of war crime or whatever. I mean, when Friedrich's book, The Fire, came out in Britain two years ago, it was either completely ignored by the media, it's quite extraordinary, completely ignored. The newspaper was just, you know, it's a, it's a major book, just wasn't reviewed, or it was subject to uh, reviews by people that everybody knew would hate the book and did so. Um, and the book Mollis died as a, as, a, you know, as a publishing venture. And in Germany it sold, I forget what the figure is, 800,000 copies. I mean, you know, it's, uh, um, so it's, I mean, it's an interesting point. It's something which I think British society has never quite, uh, quite come to terms with. Not that they need to come to terms with it you know, morally, but just need to understand what happened. You know, just need to understand the narrative. Jim Gilman. Yeah, I'd like to ask you a question, uh, it's a little bit on the order of the technological imperative, but um, do you see there are certain stages in the development of the technology of bombing where you, you have conventional bombing and then you have the incendiaries and then you have nuclear weapons? And, and how, how does that register with people? We could talk about public reactions, post-war reactions, for example, uh, resistance to nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a sort of follow through on that, but it does seem to me that in the, in the history of bombing that um, we certainly knew from the American point of view that we developed napalm, it was an industrial uh, mm -hmm. venture with the chemical 
Chemical Warfare Corps, and um, that was our invention, and certainly, you know, translated immediately over uh, to, to Europe, and, and devastatingly, of course, in the 60s city attacks on Japan. So I'm thinking about, are there technological imperatives here where there are stages in terms of, forget precision, by the way, precision bombing, forget it, let's do incendiary. Okay, let's forget that, let's do nuclear. Mm. Well, I, mean, I think the link between incendiary and nuclear is more difficult to establish, but I think that, that it certainly is a technological imperative. Yeah. I mean, all air forces, um, of course, were trying to push those thresholds forward in the 1930s. Um, and during the war in, in, in Britain, particularly, and before the United States was in the war, um, I mean, this was, this was something of an obsession. I talked about the incendiary panel, but there were two or three other major weapons committees that were set up and so on, whose job was simply to try and accelerate the technical threshold so that you could actually, you know, you could have better bombers, you could bomb more accurately, the navigation would you get the navigation right, um, the radars would be better, um, and particularly the armament, because British bombs were not very good in the early stages of the war, and so they focused a lot on getting the armament right. And so they produced not just incendiaries, but you know, tall boy, these extraordinary big bombs as well. And uh, towards the end of the war, or Barnes Wallace's famous bouncing bomb. Um, so there is a technological imperative. Yeah, I think there was. I mean, this, and it's also kind of unstoppable because um, in the course of the campaign, um, you very quickly realise what's going wrong, and so you focus your scientific effort on what you need to get right. Once you've got that right, you then go on to the next session. You know, how can we get a bigger bomb? How can we get a faster bomber? Um, and um, I mean, the, the curious thing in a way, of course, is that the, the, the atomic bomb would have ended that process <laughs> because you just need one bomber and one bomb. Um, whereas by 1945, of course, the RAF has two or three thousand heavy bombers capable of lifting uh, you know, huge tonnage in, in, in one assault. I mean, it's, it's, it now looks in terms of modern weaponry like the dinosaur. But, you know, but that's what Harris and others they all imagined it. And so they drove the system on through the course of the war to make sure that they could actually realize it. And the reason why Dresden is destroyed, and not just Dresden, but also you know, other um, German cities in 1945, uh, Fortsheim, um, uh, the reason these cities are destroyed at the end is because, in fact, they eventually got everything right eventually got the weaponry they want. They, they've managed to work out how many incendiaries you need. They've got a new incendiary. Um, uh, they've, they've managed to work out um, you know, how to bomb with you know, exceptional levels of accuracy the area of the city that you want to, to destroy. Uh, so the Dresden is really the victim of, if you like, of precisely that technological imperative. Go on. Yeah, Professor Overy. I was fascinated in your discussion in terms of uh, the bombing of Europe, and I started thinking of the countries, uh, Germany, Italy, France, Belgium, uh, uh, England, and I re realized that uh, in, my, in my bombing of Kosovo and Serbia, that, that these were allies, and that in that conflict, it was interesting how the collateral damage varied by country for the aircraft that were cast to specific targets. And just in thinking in terms of the numbers that you gave, uh, do you find that, or do you think you can draw a corollary to the degree to which states, European states endured these high level of uh, civilian deaths to the willingness for those states over time to support operations with varying levels of collateral damage? Do you think that that variation that we saw in Kosovo somehow is derived from experiences in World War II? I think it would be hard to argue that it derived, derived from it. Um, I mean, partly because it, it, it rests on the extent to which air forces by the 1990s really had a pretty long historical memory. It did have a long historical memory, actually, but I mean, when the RAF was producing its new doctrine, um, uh, it, it spent a lot of time looking back at the Second World War in the 1920s and 30s and thinking about what lessons might actually be learned from that. But um, I think it's, isn't it much more likely to be driven by the nature of the operations and the people who are doing it? I mean, in other words, it would be slightly accidental, whereas in the Second World War, 
you had to think about it because you were doing this over a long period of time and the people you were doing it to were people you were trying to liberate, of course. And, uh, well, I, I was just thinking that there were, there were different rules of engagement and different targeting process by country and those individual countries had veto on those specific uh, targets and the degree to which certain states were would allow collateral damage potential. For instance, the United States would attack targets at higher collateral damage potential than other states. And Germany would not yeah. provide strike yeah. aircraft yeah. just for yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, I'd be interested in a British performance <laughs> um, from that. I mean, they had lower levels of collateral damage, um, or not, I mean, but... Uh, very, 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 very. No, I mean, I think that, I think it'd be hard to make out a case that you know, this was linked to the things that I've been talking about. Um, but it, I mean, you know, it's clearly a product of the particular circumstances that you're, you're, you, you were confronted with. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's a very specific set of circumstances. And a very specific set of actors, I think, who are in, in, involved in it. I'm just a story, and I'd like to think that people did have that long, that long view. And I think that, I mean, I do actually think that air forces do have a long view. Actually, and I that, that I'm very impressed at the extent to which air force um, academies and so on. It's the same in, in the UK as well. They, they, that they have made a big effort to think historically. Um, but then, of course, it's a very discreet history. It's, it uh, probably goes back a century, and, and you know you can see you can see everything about the way it's evolved, and, and uh, uh, you know there are clear lessons that can be learned. I'd like to ask you a, a final question that, that um, follows from the question Harvey Sapolsky asked earlier about the effects of killing civilians. You were arguing that number one, the effect of bombing seemed to vary a lot. The general effect across countries, beneficial in Italy. Not so elsewhere, whatever. Um, second, you were saying that the effect on civilian morale was um, to produce apathy overall. I'm not sure if you were being, you know, particular countries or overall. As Harvey says, I think that most writing on history of bombing argues that it creates a backlash, that it's kind of productive in terms of civilian morale. Um, I'm thinking of Robert Pape's book, mm -hmm. um, Bombing to Win, which makes that argument. Um, and then, of course, as Harvey says, the sort of center of gravity view in the United States today is that um, killing civilians is very counterproductive in war in general, certainly in a counterinsurgency. Um, uh, it, uh, Crystal believes it's counterproductive in Iraq. He's, he's not only done everything to control the killing of civilians from the air, but also ground operations. It's a central part of the U.S. doctrine there today. What do you think we know in general about the impact of killing civilians in wartime? Um, uh, what's the sort of central tendency of the evidence? And also, has something changed over time? Is there a peculiarity that makes killing civilians you know, counterproductive in one situation and not counterproductive in another? What do you think we know about this? Well, it's a very important question. It's a big question. It hasn't been answered yet. I think, you know, we need much more material on this. I think it hasn't been answered yet. And I think that we need to know a lot more about bomb societies. Uh, also about bomb societies in the last 20 years, of course, or about, you know, the effect on Vietnam rather than just the effect in the Second World War. Um, but uh, the thing I said about apathy, um, uh, all, the, all the evidence that we've been accumulating about reactions in Germany and Italy and France and so on, that, you know, the people, <coughs> yes, there may be a, a, a backlash. Um, and, of course, Allied airmen were lynched in quite large numbers, of course, in the last months of the war in Germany when they, when they landed. Um, but, but for the actual bombed populations, um, the principal concern seems to simply be trying to reconstruct their lives, parts of their lives as quickly as possible, trying to establish where friends and neighbours are, trying to see whether the networks are there, desperately hoping if they're uh, workers, of course, that the factory is still working, that they will be able to go there. Follow. It's quite. I mean, what's quite interesting. You'd imagine that you know, what, you know the, the effect of you know your, your housing area has been burnt down. There's been a heavy bombing raid in your city. The last thing you're going to want to do is go to work. But actually, a lot of the material we've come across shows that, that what people desperately want to do is to restore some degree of normalcy. It can be even very small. There's a there's a very poignant memoir of somebody who was watching the bombing of Hamburg, but by chance he'd gone to his weekend cottage and he, he would watch the bombing of Hamburg went back in um, to where his flat was, his apartment was, um, and 
It was right in the centre of the firestorm, and the apartment and everything in it had disappeared, vaporized. It was a single thing, and, he, and that, that's what he found. He found this deeply traumatizing. But what he wanted was to find something. He wanted to be able to find, you know, a, a book, you know, a surviving chair. Or he wanted something which would root him again, even something trivial like that. And that's a small story, but it's reproduced in lots of other contexts, actually, where what people want is to be able to restore some, some degree of normalcy. But what they don't want to do, uh, and there's almost no evidence of this, is what they don't want to do is start organising resistance groups or you know, hunting out local dissenters or you know, scalding on walls. You know. um, some Germans do it. You know, the last months of the war. If they're caught scoring on the walls, you know, you did this, Adolf, they're shot, of course, immediately, which is discouraged you a great deal. So Germany's a slightly different case, I think, from um, from, from some of the others. Um, but, but I, I mean, I think, I, mean, it's, it's, I don't think this is a surprising conclusion. One thinks what bombing does. And all those strange pictures you have of people picking their way in the Blitz in London, picking their way to the rubble in the city of London just to go back to the office. And the office has got their windows and their door and so on, but they just, you know, they want to, they want to go in. Now, what lessons that gives you for bombing civilian populations today? I don't know, because very few have been subjected to that level of an intensity of, of, uh, of bombing. But I would be very surprised uh, not to find that it's exactly the same phenomenon. What they're looking for, people are looking for desperately, are friends, network, looking for some way of restoring some measure of normalcy. But what they're not really interested in is overthrowing Saddam Hussein. Um, he's overthrown a person in a different way. Um, well, wonderful. Um, uh, let's thank you for <laughs> So we also have a plaque for you. I hope you have a wall to hang it on. <laughs> well, it's a, a crowded wall. This is, this is the 2010 <laughs> Doolittle Award for contributions to the history of air power, presented to you right. by yeah. the Massachusetts right. Institute of Technology. Oh, Security many, many thanks. This will um, yes. still a little bit left in my bag. I, I was going to say, I hope you can carry it home. <laughs> right. And speaking of going home, uh, we have two facts to consider. One is that you're probably a little jet lagged because it's 1 a.m. British time or 2 a.m. British well, time. Well, I'm fine. On the other hand, uh, he can't go home because the <laughs> volcanoes won't let him. And so you did offer to hang around a bit, maybe yes. drink a little, and yeah. engage in further co celebration with people who are particularly excited about what you told us tonight. So, yeah. Yeah, anyone who nice. wants to continue the discussion, um, hang around and we yeah. will continue it for uh, until you fall asleep. Yeah. Well, I'd like the drink. That's true. The drink. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, is this a piece of slate? It's heavy, isn't it?